just to start off with, I had an inner ear issue like two days ago, so I have bouts of vertigo. Some moment I start kind of like doing this. It's not because I'm drifting off, it's because there's something in my ear bothering me. So, uh, so as, as Dave said, I'm in the School of Architecture at UVA. Uh, my work sits between design on one side, so how do we design landscapes? And then on the other side, how do we sort of study how people respond to landscapes? So really bridging the cognitive or the psychological with how we maybe imagine new possibilities for landscapes. Um, I'm in landscape architecture, uh, but also sort of blend into urban and environmental planning as well. My, my notes set up. <laughs> so the, the big question that drives my research um, is, we know that green space is good for people in many different ways, particularly our mental health. It's one of the reasons probably we all love the Arboretum, right? It's a really wonderful place to go to. Uh, but I'm really interested in this question that not all green space is perhaps equal. Places like the Arboretum are amazing. Uh, not all green spaces are as great as the Arboretum. And what does that matter, in particular for me, in the context of education? I work in my research is situated in K-12 education in the schoolyard. <coughs> to make the schoolyard a more ecologically rich space and sort of man, uh, ma uh, maximize its benefits through what I call pop-up nature, pop-up green spaces. So my research is informed by my background. Uh, prior to being a grad student, I was in land management, landowner engagement, working for people like the Piedmont Environmental Council, so I have a good experience getting my hands dirty with land management, uh, have a background in technology and how we engage with landscapes with technology. And then most recently, as a parent, I have two small children. And for me, now that my daughter is going into first grade and my son will be starting kindergarten soon, uh, I, I have a, a really strong passion addressing the issue of kids becoming further and further distant from the outside in many different ways. And I think we all probably can acknowledge that's an issue. So for me, our research tries to address that in, in particular ways. So how do we sort of shift the, the schoolyard landscape to be more ecologically rich in a way that engages kids, but also gives them psychological benefits? Bring the teachers along the process, bring the land managers along, consult the property managers, and bring the principals as well. So ultimately, that solution has to be sort of low cost because schools are highly under-resourced. has to be easily manageable because schools are highly under-resourced. Uh, it has to be aesthetically appealing because schools have a very particular aesthetic that they need in terms of like they're highly under-resourced. Uh, and it really needs to engage with curriculum because ultimately school, their goal is education. And from my perspective, then how do you also layer on some of the, the benefits of nature that it, you know, it restores our attention, it lowers our stress, it does lots of things to make us happy. So I'm doing that through what I call pop-up green spaces and exploring ways to basically take outdoor classroom spaces, uh, which are typically, uh, for my research, imagine an outdoor classroom space that's say just in a lawn, and then to, it's not uh, glamorous, but essentially bring in a bunch of planters and change the context of that space. Make it more, bring in a variety of different species mm -hmm. that are beyond just say fescue, and then look at how kids respond to that. Are they more attentive? Are they more or less stressed? Are they more or less engaged with their teacher? Um, are they more creative or not? And so there's research that has explored all this, but no one's really looked at biological richness or, or structural richness. Um, so my research to kind of make that easier has been to look at ways to scale that and make it um, deployable at, at scale. So part of what I'm doing is figuring out ways, what species to do that with at Blandy. How do you sort of deploy nature in a pop-up form using, this is an early stage prototype, essentially a trellis system. So imagine this, this, this tall and a much bigger base. This is from last summer. In ways that essentially create spaces, I brought some photos. I, I'd be remiss coming from art and design if I didn't show some pictures. So this is sort of inspirational to give you a sense visually because I think visuals are really important to kind of give you a sense of what it could look like. This is a green wall space. So the idea of the green wall as a really uh, space-saving way to improve the, the, the green space quality of, of public spaces. Here's another image of an, of an outdoor classroom space where it essentially is just blacktop. This is in Seattle. And they've essentially just dressed it up with 
with planters. So my research here at Blandy has been trying to figure out, in part, how to, how to, how to deploy this, how to scale it up. So building, this is the first phase of, of the planter boxes that I'm building, and then what species sort of go into that. So one of the, the suite of species that I'm looking at um, is really around gardening. Gardening is a great way to connect kids to nature. Gardening species grow real fast. And in particular, it's, it hits a lot of curricular pieces. So for me, I focus pretty heavily on the, the idea of the three sisters. Are people familiar with three sisters as a practice? For those of you who aren't, I'll show you a picture, but it's an indigenous practice of agriculture that before European settlement was really the dominant way that we conducted agriculture, that the indigenous people conducted agriculture in the New World from Canada to Oaxaca. So rather than having a monoculture, the field species are interplanted or co-planted and they sort of play off of each other. I like this because it speaks to a little ecology. It tells a little story of how things are interacted and connected. And so the one that I'm focused on, the, the primary one is the three sisters. So this is a little diagram to show you. So corn, which is the predominant staple crop of the new world, acts as the sort of structural member and the primary source of nutrition. Beans grow up the corn, use it as a trellis, and they also improve the soil too nitrogen fixation. And the squash, which is on the bottom, acts as a weed cover. So it's an agroecology, it's not a natural system, but it's a really eloquent, eloquent way to talk about how things are connected. We don't see it in the landscape today. If you drive through Nebraska, you don't see the three sisters you know, all over the landscape. And there's many reasons for that, but I think one is that it's aesthetically challenging to our perception of what you know, gardening or what the landscape should be. So part of my work is to figure out how to make it aesthetically interesting. So I've been doing research, just so you can see this in the greenhouse later, these are sort of experiments looking at how you take maybe inspiration from espalier or bonsai, some of those Eastern hemisphere traditions, and incorporate that with our, our more indigenous practices of cultivation. So this represents an early phase of that. And this is a, an exhibition that I just had up a few months ago. This is an indoor sort of art gallery version what this would look like at the A school. And I'll have these out, so if you want to look at them, I know it's a little hard to see, but this is an exhibition I had up a few months ago. So the way this research is gonna play out for me as I continue my work here and figuring out how to work with these species to, to make them pop up um, This following year, I'll be working with a local elementary school, my kids' elementary school, and they are just installed, installing a new outdoor classroom. So the idea is that these will be wheeled out, and some students will experience the outdoor classroom space with all this nature around. And then after that, I'll say, are the kids more attentive? Do they pay attention better? Are they less stressed? Are they more creative? Are they a variety of different psychological metrics? And then other students will just have the outdoor classroom space without the, the nature, because it'll be on wheels and just sort of wheel it in and wheel it out. And my so hypothesis is, is that kids are gonna benefit from being in aesthetically designed, ecologically rich green spaces. That's the sort of premise. Um, this work is developing. This is my second field season here, and it's, it's in progress, but I'm very excited to, to play it out. And ultimately, for me, I think sort of like Kelsey as well, there's, there's research questions behind this, but in many ways, coming from a land management and engaging with landowners perspective, I really want to show schools ways to do this. I think many people uh, they benefit from sort of actually seeing the possibilities rather than just sort of describing it and using a pop-up approach. I, I think that schools will be like, oh, this, this makes sense. I can see this as a solution, a way to, to design our, our spaces better, which to, I think is really critical, as I said, as we uh, you know, consider a future where kids are less and less outdoors. COVID-19 didn't do anything for that in any ways. So we need to figure out ways to, to connect people to nature at the, at the earliest year. That's that's pretty much it. I want to say thanks to to, say, to Dave and the friends for your friends for supporting my research. Here. That's it. Question. Oh sure. So how would you measure the uh, if the kids are less stressed? Is it just looking at the anecdotal or subjective like, from the teachers? Or? There's there's a variety of different metrics. So there's psychological metrics where you basically have like little tests you give them in the classroom. You can also have a, a, like a second person there and saying how many times. Does Say, pay attention class, pay attention class, pay attention class, look at me. 
On the creative side, uh, I'm really excited to work with an art class and have like a subjective art reviewer review. You know, I, I, my theory is that kids in an ecologically fascinating space are going to produce more interesting artwork than say in a, a bland classroom or just in, a, in a, an average you know, Dundra pavilion basically. And so have a, a second reviewer basically assess that. For stress, you can actually measure the cortisol level, so you kind of swab their mouth and you can say are they more or less stressed than they were at the beginning of class. There's a variety of different metrics to do that. Jay, can you just explain the features of this? Sure. This, yeah, sorry. So this, this is a very early prototype, so things have evolved since then, but fundamentally I was interested, I'm interested in how do you form plants into interesting shapes that are compelling aesthetically. Um, Spalier and bonsai you prune because they're long lived species. For annuals, you, you can prune a little bit, but ultimately they need to continue to grow. So my thought is to basically sort of mold them into shapes potentially uh, in ways that are aesthetically appealing. So these are first scale prototypes to figure out how far can corn bend. Can you espalier corn? Can corn bend at a 90 degree angle? You know, how do you how do you manage the beauty but the complexity of a bean plant in a way that you know, I grew a lot of bean plants last summer grown many beans before they go everywhere which is great but in a in a school context that may be a challenge in terms of management so figuring out ways to essentially do this so this was a, a test and so I had a, a time-lapse rig set up where the camera was basically where you were sitting and I could see sort of how they behaved at different little interventions you know so as you go into the greenhouse bit you'll see some of the tables I have set up where I was essentially looking at how do plants respond to different forces green wall, green materials, all that. I didn't realize we could ask questions. <laughs> I have a question for Kelsey. How does one identify a queen bumblebee? Thank you. Oh, so early in the spring, it's about all you'll find will be queens. And um, they're, they're larger than the workers. And so I actually encountered, so at first, surveying only queens only queens and then and then there were tiny bumblebees and I was like those must be the first workers of the year they're noticeably smaller than the queens and then as time goes by the workers will become larger and there might still be some queens on the landscape but they will be more similar in size and it's harder but at least when you start out early in spring you're only encountering queens and what's early in the spring March or uh, yeah, as early as March. I went from about the middle of March until the end of May, and there were definitely still queens flying well after that. Question three. Can you ask him? <laughs> <laughs>